Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lachlan Sands. I am the campus president here at the Institute of Culinary Education in Los Angeles. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this installment of our guest lecture series. As a reminder, this demonstration is going to be broadcast online. So for those of you who are watching online, please type your questions into the chat and we will endeavor to ask them of Chef Michael. For those of you who are in the room, if you have a question, wait until you get the microphone in front of you. So that way everyone online can hear and everyone else in the room can hear, okay? Our goal with these uh, demos and lectures is to highlight the culinary excellence of contemporary chefs and culinary entrepreneurs. In the last month, we have hosted michelin starred chef Tony Esnault of Knife Pleat, michelin starred chef Kevin Mian of Cut Cali, and the founder of Miyoko's Vegan Creamery, Miyoko Shinner. Our guest today is James Beard award-winning chef Michael Simarusti of the two michelin starred restaurant Providence here in Los Angeles. Chef Michael began his career with Larry Forgione at an American place in New York. And he went to Paris after that to work with Alain Passard at Arpege. He returned to New York to work at Chirco and Le Cirque. And then he came to Los Angeles in the late 90s to work at Spago with Wolfgang Puck. He then became executive chef at the renowned Water Grill downtown. In 2004, Chef Michael, his wife and business partner, Chrissy Echeverry, and his business partner, Donato Poto, uh, founded Providence. The seafood-centric restaurant has since set the standard against, all, against which all fine dining in Los Angeles is currently measured. Providence was awarded two Michelin stars in 2009, which it has retained ever since. And in 2019, Chef Michael won uh, the James Beard Award for Best Chef West. Deservedly so. Uh, he's also, he's, he's a nationally renowned expert on sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. And he's also the co-owner and chef of Connie and Ted's Best Girl and Il Pesce Cucina. Uh, on a personal note, 21 years ago, 21 years ago, chef took a risk and hired me as a line cook. Yep. And I worked for him for uh, three years. And while I don't cook professionally anymore, instead I operate the Institute of Culinary Education, uh, there's not a day goes by that I don't apply the same incredibly high standards I learned in the kitchens at Water Grill. And for that, I am always going to be grateful. So please join me in welcoming Chef Michael Simarusti. You know, I left New York as a chef de partie in one of the best restaurants in the city and then went to, you know, a restaurant in France to make no money and work 90 to 100 hours a week. And it's amazing, it's, you know, it sounds like hell. And, and, it, and it kind of felt like hell at times. But it's, you know, every bit of it, every experience along the way, I'm incredibly grateful for. Because if, if it weren't for all of that, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you, honestly. And all that, everything that Lachlan told you about what I've done in these last like 30 plus years in the kitchen never would have happened without those experiences. So. The road may be difficult and bumpy, and um, you know there may be times where you doubt your decision to enter into this career, and I, I fully understand all of that. But at the same time, it's, th it's those trials and tribulations that are going to form you into the chef that you need to be in order to be successful in this business. Um, you know, understand, try to understand as quickly as you can, once you get out there, where you really want to be what level you want to be cooking at, what type of restaurant you want to be working in, what type of cuisine you want to prepare. You know what I mean? Find something that speaks to you. If, you can, if you're able to do that, and then, then if you can translate that to the plate, you will find success, I guarantee. Especially in a big city like Los Angeles, if you choose to stay here. But I think now, like one of the most amazing things that I think I've seen over the last 30 years of cooking, like it used to be, you know, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, and then there was everybody else. And now there's incredible food all, all over this country. World class, world class food is, you, you can find it everywhere. Uh, and that's, an, that's also an incredible thing. And, um, you know, I credit that really to the proliferation of information that's out there um, via social media. You know, every one of you guys in this room probably follows, you know, Rene Redzepi and um, uh, Danielle Boulud and, 
you know, all of these incredible chefs, all these esteemed chefs that we all know, and you're able to benefit from the information that they put up there. Uh, but understand, those are just photos. Like, there's an incredible amount of work that go, went into creating whatever it was that they put on that plate. And understanding how they got there to, you know, finish a beautiful plate of food, um, that's the journey you guys are on, trying to figure that out. Because beautiful food doesn't mean anything unless it tastes good as well. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to create tasty food. And this dish is incredibly humble and incredibly simple and really incorporates only a few ingredients, most of which you see here. This fish, that clam, and those potatoes. That's it. There's nothing, well, a little bit of butter. Um, and salt, of course. So let's start. We'll, we'll start by talking about the ingredients. So I brought this guy. Everybody, does everybody know what that is? Giant clam, right? Miru guy. And then we have this guy. This is a local, this is caught off the coast of Santa Barbara. It's a local vermilion rockfish. This fish was caught by a guy named Nick Tharp, Captain Nick Tharp, on the fishing vessel First Light Out that fishes out of Santa Barbara. He killed these fish Ikejime style. So this fish was, today is what, Thursday? This fish was caught on Tuesday. But you can see the clarity of the eye and just how, per the, when, you, when I fillet, you'll see just how perfect the flesh is. We've had, we got these fish on Tuesday. We uh, cleaned them, eviscerated them gilled them, and then we hung them in a dry ager. We, they can hang in that dry ager when they've been killed this way, Ikejime style, for easily a week, even more. And the skin will dry. And if you choose to grill the fish or saute the fish in a pan, the skin that you get is absolutely incredible. Um, does anybody know what Ikejime means? Or what it is? Yes. Yes, it starts out, so there's a hole right there in the fish's head between the eyes, right in the brain. They spike the fish right in the brain. Then you take a thin wire and you run it down the length of the backbone from here all the way to the tail. And what that does is it deadens all the nerves, stops the brain from sending signals to the, um, to the rest of the fish. And, um, so what that, and then they, all, they bleed the fish as well, put the fish on ice. And that's, that's how you complete the Ikejime process. So there's several reasons why you do it. Number one, it's the most humane way to kill a fish. That's important. If you let a fish just suffocate on the deck or in a cooler, the results you get a couple of days later, a week later, are incredibly different. You, you have to see with your own eyes in order to figure that out. Um, it's something that I learned several years ago on a trip to Japan. Uh, and it's something that whenever we're able to get Ikejime fish or perform Ikejime ourselves, if we get live fish delivered to the restaurant, we do it. It's just the very best way uh, to preserve the integrity and the flavor of the fish. And also, um, like if you talk about, uh, you know, the biochemistry of what goes on as a fish ages, a fish that was killed Ikejime style will always, always result in a better product uh, and a healthier product, a more wholesome product. Because by performing Ikejime, Ikejime you kill the fish instantaneously. And that, that makes for, uh, you know, just a much, much better, much more wholesome product in the end. Um, so then uh, I'm going to show you how to play that in a minute. I want to show you how to clean this guy first. So these guys are grown in Washington State. Uh, they're also, you can also find them wild on the beaches uh, in the north, in the Pacific, specifically Alaska. You can still find wild gooey duck. Um, these guys are one of my, absolutely one of my favorite ingredients, ingredients no matter how gruesome they may look. Uh, in order, if this guy's still alive, um, they grow like that. They grow them like this on vast farms in tubes. So they plant a tube in the beach, they take a young guy and they stick it down in the sand, and they come back several years later, and you get something like this. I've had wild ones from Alaska like that. They're absolutely just amazing. And they're filter feeders. This is zero input farm shellfish, which is something I'm a big proponent of. I'm also a big proponent of wild seafood over farm-raised seafood. And that's something we could do a whole nother class just up based on that, why? But my first and foremost, the reason for me is flavor. You will never, ever be able to approximate the flavor of this fish with a farm-raised fish. Not going to happen. And why is that? It's because of the feed that they give farm-raised fish. What do, you get, what do you suppose this guy eats in the wild? Huh? Kel no, okay, he's not a vegetarian. No, yeah, he'll eat smaller fish. He'll eat mollusks. He'll eat invertebrates. Um, he'll eat pretty much anything as long as it swims. Um, or crawls, or creeps, whatever. He'll eat it. But um, a farm-raised fish is going to eat a diet that's based on grains and soy. 
So this guy was never meant to consume grains and soy. Just not, that's not his natural diet. So if you feed a fish grains and soy, what do you think it's going to wind up tasting like? Grains and soy, exactly. You want to prove it to yourself? Go buy a piece of beautiful, wild California king salmon, which is in season right now. They're catching it in Fort, Bra Fort Bragg and at Morro Bay uh, and at Moss Landing. All in incredible, incredible fish uh, caught right here off the coast of, the, of California. So go buy a piece of that and then go to Ralph's and go buy a piece of farm-raised crap from, Nova, from you know, British Columbia or wherever else and cook them side by side and taste it for yourself. And I guarantee if you don't think the wild fish tastes better, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> Sorry. <That's, laughs> I'm very passionate about wild fish. If you can't tell. So anyway, to clean the meter guy, there, there's two shells, right? It's a bivalve, right? And you just take like a palette knife like this one, and you slide it in along the inside of the shell, and then you repeat the process on the other side, like that, until you can free it from the shell, like this. And there's all sorts of like unspeakable stuff in here. <laughs> like, what, what is that? I have absolutely no idea. This part right here as well, can you see this? This part, the entrails, is what we use to make the sauce that is right here. Everything that we, that everything that we don't actually eat uh, goes into the sauce. So we'll save all this along with all the juice. So now you have this big old thing, right? Uh, so the next step in order to prepare it is to just drop it in a pot of simmering water. This is like the water, it's just beneath a boil. And then I have an ice bath right here. Just let them chill out in there for maybe like 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Then we'll pull it out and we'll ice them down and we'll clean it the rest of the way. Basically, like they have this, um, they have this skin over the flesh that you have to remove. And also there is um, oftentimes inside the siphon, which is what the part that you eat, there is um, sand. And so you have to remove that because remember, these guys are fil filter feeders and they live in the sand. So they're pulling into their, into, the, um, into their siphon, they're pulling water and sand and everything that they need to survive is in that water that they pull out. So they're, they're filter feeders, just like an oyster is a filter feeder, just like a mussel is a filter feeder. Everything that they need is in the water that they live in. So if you um, take a towel, you can clean some of this discolor, the discolored end of the, cl of the clam. It's... You know, honestly, this is just for aesthetic. I mean, aesthetic. I, don't, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing aesthetically pleasing about this, but to be honest with you guys. But, um, but anyway, you can clean that part, right? So then you see there's like two, there's two sides to this clam, like that, it's split right down the middle. So you just take a knife and you make a little incision here. And then once you've done that, you can just pull it apart like this. If you look really closely, you'll see some of the sand that we were talking about right there. So then I'll put it back in the ice water and just scrub the sand away like that. So next step in the process for this guy, I, I'm not going to complete in front of you, but it's not a big deal. So we make a broth with this and that, all the, all the unspeakable bits. And, um, and then we take that broth, we put it in a sous vide bag. We put both pieces of the, all the clam in there, seal it up, and then we cook it at a, you can even just like drop it into a pot of simmering water for like 30 seconds, just to like set the flesh is all we're doing. And that's what they look like when they come out. I mean, appreciably not much difference really. Um, the only thing it does is it, well, it, it, um, it kind of kills the animal because these, this guy, I mean, I, well, I mean, we've took, we've taken a lot away from him in a short period of time, but. He's still got a lot of, there's still a lot of life in that, in that thing. And, you know, Mito guy, if you go to a, like a sushi restaurant, usually they slice it thin and then they'll pound it with the back of their knife like that to kind of tenderize it because it has a real chew. And some people, some people don't like that chew. I think it's amazing. Like it's one of my favorite textures. It's also one of my favorite flavors. And I feel that like Mito guy, if you want to know what the ocean tastes like, what seafood tastes like, taste Mito guy. Like it's just so incredible and so incredibly sweet. And the broth that it gives you is also incredibly sweet. And this dish is really a celebration of the flavor of this guy, complemented with another piece of, 
you know, local seafood. Um, you know, both of these things native to the Pacific. This fish, it was caught in Santa Barbara, but you could you could catch the same fish up in Washington State, right off the shores where these guys are living. Um, so when you have ingredients like that that grow together, they probably go together. That's a good thing to remember too, and it rhymes. So now for the dish, I have a whole bunch of it right there. For the dish, basically what we're gonna do is just cut this into like nice big chunks. Um, and the other thing I love about Mutagai and I love about this dish is um, just the beautiful shape that the Mutagai has when you cut it like that. And these are the kind of things that to me, when I'm cooking or thinking about con conceptualizing a dish, these are the kind of things that get me started oftentimes. Like that's, it's such a beautiful shape. How, what can you do to accentuate that? What can you do to present that in a very simple way so people can appreciate the beauty of it? And that's part of the reason why this dish um, came into existence. Another part of the, uh, another reason that it came into existence is we have a guy, he was at the restaurant last night. He literally comes every week. Um, and so, and uh, pretty much every time he comes, we give him a different uh, menu. And that is a menu that's usually eight or nine or 10 courses long. And so when you have people like that, that come in all the time, you, you have to create, um, it spurs you to create. Um, and this is one of the dishes, the dish that you guys are gonna try is one of the dishes that came about cooking for this guy. And we now, you know, it's a great challenge. It's, it's a fun challenge you guys could, you know, try at home, like cook, cook a different dinner every single night, come up with something different every single night and, you know, try cooking it or try doing it for eight or nine courses. Um, but anyway, it's, um, it's great. Every time he comes in, we write everything down. We catalog all the, you know, the ingredients and everything. And then we photograph everything that the guy gets so that we have like this running sort of um, uh, database of, of dishes that we've created for this guy. And I, like last night he was in, we did a dish for him that I'm sure is going to go on the menu during in the winter months. Um, you know, uh, this dish is going to go on the uh, on the menu at Providence in the winter months. Um, you know, it's I don't know, being able to cook like that and create all the time is um, it can be a pain in the ass at times, but it, but it's also it's also a great challenge. And I'm appreciative to have guests that come in like that as often as as this guy does, uh, so that we have to do that. So for this rockfish. Um, I'm going to show you how to fillet it. I'll just show one side. You guys probably know how to fillet fish. But anyway, when, this, when these guys came in, we scaled them all, we gutted them all, we removed the gills, and then, as I said, we hung them in our dry ager. So I'm just going to fillet, um, fillet one side of it. And before I do that, I'm going to take the head off the fish. And again, we use the, uh, the head for the fish to make broth, um, to make stock, um, to make infusions. Uh, but we don't, I don't like to keep the head on when I fillet. And so I'll take it off. Okay. So what I do is I'll have the backbone of the fish facing me. Uh, and, or sorry, the, the backside of the fish, the belly facing you guys, right? And you just come right down the, right down the backbone like that. And then I cut the fillet square at the tail. And then once you have it opened up, I could probably turn it towards you so you can see better. But once you have it opened up, you can kind of see the, uh, the, ba the bones of the fish right there. And I'm just going to run my knife down the bones until I get to the backbone of the fish, which is right here. Can you see that? <laughs> you can see the backbone? <laughs> I didn't hear anything. So, that, so that I now I just put the knife right over the backbone and then come down on the other side like that. Now I'm going to cut through the rib bones with some short, sh like, kind of violent strokes like that to break the ribs. Some people like the fillet where they go over the ribs. Uh, when you do that, you lose a lot of flesh. You, and the, you lose a lot of the belly of the fish. And, uh, you know, for this fish, it's maybe not as important. But for some fish, it, the belly is the very best part. So you don't want to do that. If you cut over the ribs, a lot of times you're going to lose all of that. So now the backbone's exposed. We cut, freed, the, um, freed the fillet from the bones back here and freed the fillet from the bones here. So the only thing holding it on is this little bit of flesh right here. So I'm holding onto the ribs and I can just run my knife like right down like that to remove it. Um, and then in order to take the ribs out, you turn your knife over like this. So the blade is kind of facing up to the sky. And you just go under the ribs like that. See how the ribs are separated now from the fillet? 
Then I'll turn it back towards me and get my knife under the, under the ribs and just cut them away like that. So that's a fillet. And then we have obviously the pin bones in there, right guys? All, all round fish have pin bones in the fillet right here. I'm not gonna take them out, it's too much. Thank you though, Miller. Miller's always right there when you need him. That's why I brought him. So now, um, what we would do with this in the restaurant is uh, we'll put the fish on a rack and we'll salt them. We do this with almost everything. Some fish we use a wet brine, like uh, for instance, black cod, we use a wet brine. So it's like um, we use a little bit of brown sugar, we use sea salt and water, and we make a wet brine, and we leave the, the fillets of black cod in there for about an hour to, or two hours. It depends upon the thickness of the fillet. With fish like this, um, we'll just simply salt it with sea salt pretty liberally, like you were going to put the fish on the grill, but maybe even a little bit more than that. And we'll season both the flesh and the skin. And then we'll let the fish sit for 10 or 12 minutes depending upon the thickness of the fillet. Like if this, if this a fish that size, I would let it go for like 12 minutes. Uh, set a timer, when it's done, you just rinse it and then the fish is pretty much ready. So you rinse the fish, towel it dry, and then we put them on, leave them on racks in the refrigerator and we don't cover it with plastic wrap, we cover it with cheesecloth. This way this, the air is still circulating around the fillet and the skin will continue to dry. Uh, and that's an important thing if you wanna have served fish with a crispy skin whether like from the grill or from um, you know, a saute pan. Um, in our case today, we're actually gonna steam the fish. Can you take that? Uh, and we're gonna steam it right over there in that beautiful oven that you have. So I wanna talk about the other components of the dish. We have these, um, these beautiful little um, German butterball potatoes from Alex Weiser of Weiser Farms. We have the filet of fish itself, and then we have the sauce which is just kind of like simmering away right here. And this sauce is just all of the, the broth from the giant clam that we were talking about before. We put a little bit of shallot in there. We put thyme and bay leaf in there. Um, and then we simmer it all down. And then once we get the kind of flavor that we're looking for out of the scrap from the gooey duck, then we strain it out and just finish it with cold cultured butter. And I actually put a little tiny touch of cream in there as well. Just like a little bit for all you people that are conscious about dairy. I don't know, I don't know how many of you are, but anyway, I guess I don't need that anymore. Um, so in order to finish the dish, we just have a couple more steps. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blanch the skin of the fish. So um, the reason I do that is like, we're, we're gonna cook this guy in that oven at just about 155 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's not quite enough heat to like really denature the skin itself. So the fish would be cooked if I didn't blanch it, but the skin would still be tough. So in order to make sure that that doesn't happen, what I do is just have the fish on a little tray, ladle, I have the boiling water here, and I'm just gonna ladle a little bit right over the fish. And you see like immediately the fish seizes up like that. Whoops. You see immediately the fish seizes up. And that's what we want, because now we know that the, the skin is cooked and it'll be tender. And then we can just pop it in the oven for, and set a timer for four minutes. So four minutes, we'll cook it. And uh, meanwhile, I'm going to warm the potato just in a little bit of the same broth that we made for the plate. And um, by the way, the potatoes, so we sliced them as thick as we wanted them then we actually cooked them in the same clam broth. So um, we made the broth, cool the broth down because you should never start potatoes in hot water. Everybody knows that, right? You never start potatoes in hot water. Always start them in cold water. Otherwise the starch like seizes up and the texture will never be the same. So we've made the broth, cool the broth down. We shaped the potatoes. First we cut them in the thickness that we want. Then we punched them out with a um, oval cutter. And then we just, you turn them just to take the sharp edges off the potato. And the, why do you think we do that? Aesthetics, yes. The sharp edges will crumble when the potatoes are properly cooked. So if you take, just knock the edge off a little bit with a paring knife, it'll have a nice, a much more pleasing natural shape. So now um, while the fish is cooking, I'm just gonna warm the potato all the way through. 
And then we have our lovely plate that we're going to finish the dish with on. These plates are I had custom made for the restaurant. It's like my favorite pattern. Um, it's from a British designer. Um, and they, they make all sorts of plates with this design on them, but they didn't make this plate, big giant bowl like this. And so I asked them to do it and they were lucky, they were kind enough to do it for me. And so we use these plates for everything at the restaurant. Can I have a towel? Even a paper towel. You guys can go ahead and blanch that fish. Thank you. It's hot in here. And I schwitz a little bit, sorry. So they're gonna, um, while I'm talking, they're gonna prepare plates for you guys. I'm gonna buff this plate. I think we have like, how much time do we have to kill? Uh, how, until the fish is done. Uh, like two minutes. Two more minutes? We have time for one quick question. Anybody have a question? Huh? My wife. <laughs> I met her. At, I met her at the CIA. She's a she's a she's a trained chef, but she always worked in pastry. She was a pastry chef at a couple different restaurants in New York City. Then we moved out here. She was pastry chef for three different Wolfgang Puck restaurants, where she just traveled around and oversaw the pastry um, menus uh, in these different restaurants. We've been uh, married for th almost thirty years, but together for like thirty five. And she's, she's honestly like, her food, her food is just amazing. She doesn't cook professionally. She helps manage the restaurant and everything, but she doesn't cook professionally anymore, but she's just, she's a badass cook. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, where did your passion for seafood come from? I'm a fisherman. I fish as often as I can here in Southern California or wherever I travel. I always like plan vacations around fishing spots. Um, so it's, yeah, it's like my absolute passion. And I, you know, like the, the reason I got into cooking in the first place, I think, you know, was definitely through my, my family. Um, you know, we ate, we always had incredible meals at home. My mother was a great cook. My grandmother was a great cook. Um, and then, you know, all of that, all that while, while I was growing up, I, I fished literally every day. And I think somehow those two things just kind of morphed into, you know, the career that I have now. Um, and also, you know, like the incredible, the incredible joy that I experience when I'm fishing, I feel like an, a need to help in some small way to preserve it. Like that, that resource for other people, for other generations, uh, because Honestly, that's, a, you know, we're at the point where that's what we stand to lose if we don't, you know, if we all don't take a stand and do what's right by the ocean. I mean, do what's right by the world, of course. Um, first and foremost, sustainability is not just about, you know, the fish that you buy or whatever. There's, it's all encompassing. Um, but yeah, it's honestly, you know, there's no more soothing place to be, I, I think, than on the water. Is the fish ready? So now look, guys, see this right here? You'll be the best fish cook you know if you just buy one of these. 99 cents. Just, this will tell you if the fish is done or not. So if, if I put this into the center of the filet and it stops really quickly, I'll know the fish is raw, not quite cooked. If it passes through with just like general resistance at the very center, it's probably warm all the way through. Uh, and that's what like just your sense of touch will tell you. But then if you touch it to your wrist or to your lower lip, that will tell you how warm it is inside. And you don't want it, like, if, you, if I go like this, and I touch my lower lip, and I flinch in pain, the fish is overcooked, get another piece, start over. It's just done. Nothing you can do about it. But it, if it has this just gentle resistance like that, then I know the fish is done. Also, I can just tell by the temperature. What do you call that? Huh? What do you call that? This is an Atico cake tester. Atico. That's the name of the company. 99 cents. You can also buy fancy ones now, like... Uh, if you go, who goes to um, Now Serving, downtown Los Angeles? What? I'm going to have to tell my friend. <laughs> now Serving is the finest bookstore for all things cooking in Los Angeles. You should all know about it. It's in Chinatown. It's the best. He sells fancy ones that cost you 12 or 13 bucks. But they do the same. This does the same thing, and it's only 99 cents. I've also, like when I was working in France, there were guys there that just took a cork and stuck a paper, a straightened paper, paper clip in it, and that'll also help. 
Uh, and that's also cheaper than 99 cents. So in order to plate the dish, now my potato's warm. It just has this lovely kind of like nappe. The sauce has a lovely kind of nappe consistency. Um, and you know, this sauce, I think it's also important to point out, like when I was, when I was talking about this dish with all the other chefs in the kitchen, um, what I told them is like, I wanted to have like a, a clam broth that had like a really cream, uh, silky consistency. And, um, and the way it turns out to achieve that is to not use any automated um, tools at all. So like this has like real like kind of like clam chowder vibes to it, which I really love. Like real well-made chowder is one of my favorite things. But honestly, the only way to achieve that is just with a whisk or by swirling the butter in. So like reduce the, so re reduce the stock down to the point where it has good flavor and then finish it with a butter. But just gently, you take cold butter, dice it, and just kind of swirl it in. And this sounds like it's a very small detail, but I assure you it's not. Because if I were to take this sauce and make it the same way, but make it with an immersion blender, you know, a stick blender, if I reduce the broth down and I throw the butter in there and I go, and just buzz it up, number one, the sauce will look different. It will have a different mouthfeel and it, the flavor will be different as well. Because the emulsion that you get from using a, an immersion circulator is a much stronger emulsion. But it, in some ways, I think it kind of hides nuanced flavor like this sauce it reveals everything it's very because there's it's just so simple it's just reduced clam broth a little bit of butter a couple drops of cream and a squeeze of lemon you know what i mean so it's all there it's all very laid out laid out very plain but it carries a ton of flavor and it has a lot of presence in your on your in your mouth if you if you did it a different way i believe it just wouldn't do that you know if i were to take a stick blender and put it in there and buzz it up it just wouldn't be the same so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to warm a few pieces of mirugai in the broth. Just to get it warm again. I don't want to cook it any further. It's already cooked. I just want it to be warm. And I'm going to place the fish right here, right next to the potato. This plate, like, um, you know, we always plate everything. So the tree trunk, when we, when we tell people how to present it in the dining room, we say the tree trunk should be at 7 or the tree trunk should be at 6 or 5 or whatever. So I, I kind of like that about the plates because it leaves no um, leaves nothing to chance. So now the sauce is warm through. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to spoon it over the fish. Na this is called nappe. So nappe is a verb, but it's also a noun. Or is it a noun? I don't know. It's a, it describes a consistency. So what does that make it? You're the doctor. Adjective. adjective, thank you. It's an adjective. So so nappe means in French means to cover, right? So if this were not nappe consistency, it would uh, it would just kind of slough right off the fish uh, and right off the potato. But because it's nappe consistency, it kind of clings to the skin of the fish just a little bit. And that's exactly how I want it. Just like that. Super simple. And then I'm going to finish it with a little um, Piment d'Espelette. Piment d'Espelette, anybody know what it is? It's like, a, it's almost like a cayenne pepper. Lachlan knows this. We used it way back then. I don't use, uh, we use white pepper and black pepper in the restaurant, but only for poultry and meat. We don't use it for fish. For fish, we use Espelette, or you can use cayenne sometimes. It depends upon what you're after. But that's it. That's the dish right there. So, so this, the, what's wonderful about it is it has just, it has a lot of flavor, has just a tiny little bit of heat, and it's just absolutely delicious. And uh, in this case, I put it on, like sometimes we'll put it on the fish before we cook it. In this case, I want to put it on after we cook it because it will have the most presence, the most flavor if I just sprinkle it on at the end. So then I'm going to finish the fish with just a little bit of Malden salt, which is something you should always have in your, in your pantry at home. It's the very best salt to use to finish things, you know, to finish a, a cooked piece of fish or a cooked steak or a cooked chicken, or even just like when you make toast in the morning and slather, but, slather butter on it and just put a bunch of malden salt on it. It's just, it's the very best. Uh, so anyway, that's the dish. Yes, it's very simple. Sorry to disappoint you. It's not architectural. It's not, uh, there's not seven foams and eight oils and everything else, but it's simple and it gets right to the point. It's about fish and potatoes and clams, and that's all I wanted it to be. So there you go. You'll all get a chance to see it up close when we're done. Yeah. So.
Make sure you taste everything. I already tasted this many times before you got here. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, now what? Now what? Time for a beer? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Questions. Questions. We have lots of questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, your team, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a million unexpected challenges every day. There's another one. And you just, I mean, I think, I think, you know, the people that stay in it for the long haul are, you know, the people that can kind of roll with it. Like you may not roll with it gracefully, but you figure out a way to roll with it. And then you just, you know, keep pushing forward. Cause I firmly believe like, you know, like the day you decide, you know, your best work is behind you. That's the day you got to get out. You know what I mean? Cause you, you just have to constantly keep pushing forward because if you don't, if you don't, you do, and you start to settle or, Oh, that's good enough. Whatever it is. Like it's just, you know, that's when you're done. You just got to get out, do something else. Hi, chef. Hi. As a chef, as a fish enthusiast, I was wondering what is your favorite fish and why? Uh, I got a million of those too. Um, probably like my favorite, my favorite fish to catch, and one of my favorite fish to cook for sure is a striped bass in the East Coast. You know, it's just it's a beautiful, it's an incredible, majestic fish. As a matter of fact, if you if you if anybody's here from the north from North America, um, Northern California, you know you can catch striped bass underneath the um, Golden Gate Bridge. You know, I mean they're they're out there. Um, but you know, more typically you find them on the East Coast. Every, like the range is like from north about North Carolina up to um, like just a bit north of Massachusetts. They don't quite make it up to like Maine and New Hampshire. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean it's a it's an incredible fish. It's a storied fishery on the East Coast. It's one of the you know it's one of the most beautiful fish that swims as far as I'm concerned. It's an incredible sport fish. To, you know to catch them is just amazing. And you know this year I usually go to Martha's Vineyard. Or in Massachusetts, like Gloucester, and then um, Martha's Vineyard for at least a couple weeks every summer. And this year, I brought all my Ikejime gear, and I killed a bunch of striper Ikejime style, and I killed bluefish Ikejime style, and I killed black sea bass Ikejime style. And it's just the difference is just unbelievable. Like I never had bluefish before that had been cut, killed Ikejime style because it just doesn't find its way into the market. Um, it's absolutely amazing. You know, it gets a bad rap as being fishy or whatever. Um, but it's it's such an incredible fish if it's handled well. Chef, with uh, all the amazing seafood you have, I'm, I'm to your right. <laughs> hey, hey, chef. Way to the right. <laughs> with all the amazing seafood you have, what is your food cost percentage? Woo. <laughs> no, I mean, it's actually fairly good. Um, you know, our menu, at Providence, we only do tasting menus. So, um, and we use like the most expensive ingredients that we can find. And I don't buy them because they're expensive. I buy them because they're the best quality. You know, like for instance, right now we have, uh, you know, like one of our muses, wild Japanese hiramasa, which is also known as yellowtail, which is, you know, from uh, northern part of Japan, wild fish, killed the Gijime style. We buy it from Toyasu market twice a week. You know, that's like 30 bucks a pound. Um, you know, we buy uh, new Nor Norwegian La king crab. That's part of the menu. That's 50 bucks a pound. We buy um, Hokkaido uni, which is a big part of the menu. We also buy local uni, but there are lots of times in California where the wind and the weather keep uni fishermen off the water. And so you have to turn somewhere else to find it. And we usually get it from Hokkaido. But I mean, at times we're paying $200 a tray for Hokkaido uni, and that's part of the menu. The Thai snapper, right, which we get also from Japan, wild ikijime. That's our sashimi fish right now. That costs anywhere between $45 and $50 a pound. Um, so the ingredients that we use are incredibly expensive, but the menu is also priced so that, you know, the portions are such and the menu is priced in a way that food costs usually works out to be right around $30, 31 32 It depends. During white truffle season, it goes up because, you know, white <laughs> truffles are, you know, whatever they are, $3,000 a pound, sometimes $3,500, sometimes more. And we go through several pounds a week. So, th and you never really make the money back on, you know, if you shave white truffle, if you shave seven grams, which is a quarter ounce, if you shave seven grams on a portion, th when the truffles are $4,000 a pound, you figure you get, you, you know, a pound is how many grams? Yes, for who said that? Kudos, 454, you gotta know these things. You will start if you start if you are an avid recipe creator, which we are at the restaurant. Like everything we make, we create a recipe for. The, you have to do it in grams. You can't do it in cups. You can't do it with tablespoons. You have to do it in grams. It's the only way to do it. Um, so you got to know what was that? We were talking about troubles. 
So if you buy a pound of truffles, it's 454 grams, but you figure 30 grams or 40 grams is going to be dirt because truffles grow on the ground. You got to clean them before you serve them. So now you have 420 grams. Then every day you're going to lose 10% or five, five anywhere, somewhere between five to 10% just in evaporation, just water loss. So you figure that. So now you're down to, for a pound of truffles, you're probably going to sell 360, 380 grams. So at $4,000 a pound, that means what? They cost about $10, $12 a gram. And a gram is, I mean, everybody smokes weed. So you know what three and a half grams looks like, right? Or you know what three and a half grams, let's be real. Come on. I have kids your age, I know. But three and a half grams, you know what it feels like, right? So that, imagine that, you know, costing you, uh, well, you, you can't imagine because that's kind of what weed costs. <laughs> Once again, um, well, we, we were talking about white truffles. <laughs> they're ex the moral of the story is that they're expensive and it will make your food costs go up. <laughs> Trouble Brothers, or among other people. But also, like, listen, and this is important, like, food costs, labor costs, all, everything else, I we don't, I talk about it with my partner and my wife, who's also my partner, my business partner, I mean. I talk, we talk about it sometimes with our investors, but I don't talk about it with the crew, and I don't talk about it with, not in the kitchen and not in the front of the house. Why? This is, here's why. Because I think, no matter what the restaurant is, whether it's a, if you have aspirations for Michelin stars, or you just want to serve a good burger, you have to worry about experience, the experience of the guests first in the dining room and what they put in their mouth. That's what matters. And if you take care of those two things, everything else will fall in the line. I'm a firm believer in that. Because when I buy ingredients, I don't ever ask people what they cost, except for white truffles. Because mm. <laughs> you got to keep the Italians honest. I can tell you, I can say, I'm Italian, I'll tell you. Because honestly, and here's the other thing you need to know, like the Truffle Brothers or any other truffle dealer or somebody, or even Caviar, they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, how much are the truffles? Oh, for you, $3,600 a pound. But then I'll talk to my friend Josiah over at Melise in Santa Monica and say, how much do you pay? He goes, 39. What did you pay? I'm like, um, yeah, 39. <laughs> that happens too. So you got to make sure, you know what I mean? Pay your bills on time and you'll get better prices. That's another important lesson. But honestly, worry about experience first. Experience in the dining room, the experience that the guests have while they're in your restaurant, that will take care of everything else. Because the most expensive thing in a restaurant it's not white truffles or the ingredients that you use. It's an empty seat. That's the most expensive thing in a restaurant. So I, as I understand it, you're from New Jersey, right? I'm from New Jersey. So, and then you said favorite fishing spot, Martha Vineyard, favorite fish is from New England primarily. So what were the reasons towards opening up Providence in Los Angeles? What advantages did this location have over New England? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I believe me, I ask, my th I ask myself that question a lot. And like the first, I, vote, I was only out here for like a, a few years. Well, I, that's not true. So I moved here in like 95 and I uh, spent like a year at the original Spago, which is not there anymore. Um, and then, um, but the whole time I was thinking, oh, I'm going to move back to New York and open something there. I'm going to move back to New York and open something there. And, you know, and then like, you know, then we had kids and like, you know, life just kind of happened. And then also, like, you know, I was at the Water Girl. I spent, like, seven years there. Started to make a, bit, a little bit of a name for myself in Los Angeles. And I figured, like, might as well just stick with it. You know, like, I've already invested several years here. Um, by the time we opened Providence, I'd already been in L.A. for, like, eight or nine years. I had, you know, a good, um, you know, I had a reputation here. And, and I had access to investors here and all that kind of stuff. It just kind of happened, you know. Uh, and then we found, like, just, like, the perfect spot. Which Providence, if you don't know, before before it was Providence, it was a restaurant called Patina, and um, Patina was for many years. Patina was for many years like the the benchmark for fine dining in Los Angeles, and then they p pulled up stakes and they moved from Melrose, where Providence is, to the concert hall, uh, the Walt Disney Concert Hall downtown, and when they did that. Um, Joachim, who's the owner and the chef of uh, Patina, he called me because we had a relationship. He used to come to the water grill and eat a lot. And um, he called me and asked me if I would be interested in leasing this, the, the restaurant. 
And uh, of course, did you finish with uh, Espelette? Yeah, okay, of course you did. Um, Miller is Miller, he's just, the guy's on the spot. Um, so then he called me and asked me if I'd be interested in, um, and you finished with Malden's Hall? And uh, he asked if I'd be interested in leasing the restaurant and it, it all just kind of fell into place that way. And, and I'd looked at so many different spots in LA and what, what appealed to me about Patina was that it already, it was built to be a gastronomic restaurant. You know, we have a, we have a $10,000, or sorry, a 10,000 bottle wine cellar. You know, we have a big spacious kitchen. Um, you know, we have, we had plenty of room to grow into the space. And so it just made, it just made perfect sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Taste the sauce first, guys. You might not have enough. You have enough? You have more sauce back there? Make sure you put plenty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for someone that's uh, graduating soon and looking for work, do you have any advice for us? Do you have any? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, right now it's a seller's market and you guys are selling. Every, not, I mean, most every restaurant in Los Angeles is looking for people. Um, so, you know, you kind of have your pick. So I think, you know, be choosy. You know what I mean? Go to a place where they're gonna, where you're going to learn something, where, you know, you'll be respected for your work and appreciated for your work, where you think you, you have a future, where they have a nice facility. Like, honestly, you know, like we have a beautiful kitchen at Providence. We have a beautiful kitchen at Connie and Ted's and I can't work any other way. Like I can't work in a tiny little hovel with six burners and, you know, and you're bumping into people every other minute. And I just can't, I can't do that. I need space. I need good tools. I need, you know, um, I need to be in a, in a nice environment to work. And I think that's what you should be looking for. You know, go somewhere that's well equipped, well run, well organized, where, you know, you have a chef that's respected and uh, a chef that's going to respect you. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then go and work hard. Forget about the clock. You know, don't count the hours that you work. It's not important. Count, you know, count the knowledge that you gain. Think about that. You know what I mean? Every time you, you have a hard day at work for whatever reason, like, think of it, it's a blessing. You know what I mean? It's a chance to grow. Like when you were a kid and you were growing, it hurt like hell, right? You have growing pains. It's the same thing's going to continue to happen in your professional career. But every time, you know, you face like discomfort or you face um, situations where, you know, you think it's just too damn tough. I can't go on. Those are the opportunities where you have that, that you have to grow. You know what I mean? Like if, 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 if it's, if it feels difficult, if it feels um, challenging, good. You know what I mean? You need to be challenged in order to grow. You need to be challenged in order to learn. Like if you're if you're not if you're not challenged, you're not going to grow. So just find a you know find a good spot. I mean, money is important. Everybody's got to live, but sometimes the richest experience is not going to come with the highest paycheck. You know what I mean? You have to think about that too. You know. Yes. Um, first of all, this is absolutely delicious, so thank you. <laughs> um, secondly, along your journey as a chef, um, what restaurant that you've worked at has been the most influential to yeah. you? So for me, it was a restaurant in New York City on uh, 65th Street in Park Avenue. It's called Le Cirque. It's like, you know, and the, back in the day, it's where, you know, Danielle Boulud came out of that kitchen. Um Many other very well-known and respected French chefs came out of that kitchen. Um, thanks, guys. Um, you know, it's just, it's just an, uh, it's an amazing place. We worked with the very best of everything. We had the finest ingredients at our disposal. Um, it, uh, the chef had an incredible repertoire, so we're always doing something different and learning something new. I spent, uh, I spent like four years there. And I also spent time, like, when I first started there, I mean, the whole time I worked there, by the way, we worked six days a week, minimum 13, 14 hours a day. And I didn't know anything different. Like, 
every restaurant, all the restaurants I worked at back in the day in Manhattan, they were that. That was how we, they were. They had one crew. Most places are open six days a week, and you work all damn day. And it's hard. You know what I mean? It's a grind. But like I said, I would never. I I wouldn't be here in standing in front of you. I didn't go if I didn't have that experience. It just wouldn't. Um, that that's definitely the most influential place that that I spent time, for sure. Okay. Last last question. Oh. <laughs> hey, chef. Thank you for a great meal today. And speak right here. And this, uh, speaking about your evolution, how did you know when it was time to go to the next thing? That's a great question. Honestly, I kind of felt like, um, like I didn't, I didn't move around all that much. You know, I spent, uh, you know, a good chunk of time with the Cyric. I spent a good chunk of time with Larry Forgione in Manhattan. Um, I spent, um, you know, I spent about a year in France, a year at Spago, and then I spent seven years at Watergirl. Uh, and there was time, you know, there was time before that, before I went to culinary school and stuff like that. But, you know, I think it's time, sometimes, you know, the chef just kicks you out. Sometimes, like, you know, you gotta go do something else. Or like in my case uh, with like the, like the Cirque, uh, you know, I left. Um, I left to go and work at in France for a year. Then I came back, and then he gave me a. Then I became a chef at one of their restaurants, um, and then you know I just kind of felt the urge to move out here. But um, I think prof professionally and personally, you know, the time to move on or the time to take the next step is when it just, you know, just everything feels right. Like don't chase titles, don't chase money. You know what I mean? Like I, I understand money is important. But money will come and, you know, probably uh, it will be better in the long run if you really spend your time, learn your craft, learn the ins and outs of this trade, uh, learn how to manage people, you know, learn how to run a kitchen um, and learn how to be responsible with money. Because I think that's very important, too, like in your personal life and in your professional life, especially if you, you know, before I opened Prominence, I was working for other people. So when you work for other people, you're working with their money. You know what I mean? So you have to, you know, when I worked at, for instance, at like Water Grill or Spago, it was much more important that I always hit the numbers or at least try to hit the numbers. Because if I didn't hit the numbers, then guys would come in suits and tell me that I have to hit the numbers. And like, <laughs> and make, you know, you got to jump through all these hoops and try to figure out where you're losing money or how to, you know, how to be more efficient, that kind of thing. So you got to learn all that. You know what I mean? And that's a lot, you know. Right now, like I said, right, what you need to be doing is like honing your craft. You know what I mean? Like, don't even worry about being a sous chef or a chef or don't think about titles right now. Learn how to be a great cook. Learn how to be somebody's best employee. That's important. You know what I mean? Like, go in there, like, bust your ass and do more that's expected of you. Uh, you know, whatever. Show up early. Stay late. Work harder than everybody else. Get, be hungrier than everybody else to learn. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you get ahead, honestly. That's the only way you get ahead, really. Knowledge is power, yeah? That's it. No, seriously. Because in a kitchen, I really do believe, like, kitchens are a meritocracy. You know what I mean? Yes, there's some politics at play. But if you're the best cook in the kitchen, everybody's going to know it. And then opportunity will come from that. All right. Thank you, Chef. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we have... This this brings to a close this installment of our our uh, guest lecture series. Uh, stay tuned, and those of you online, stay tuned. On the 26th of uh, September, we'll be having Chef Chuy Cervantes, who is the chef de cuisine from Damia uh, on campus. That's Enrique Olvera's restaurant here in Los Angeles. Great so, stuff. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So again, everyone, please thank Chef Michael for his time today. Thank you, guys. There are a lot of you. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my glasses, but I can see you all. Thank you, guys.